I'm James Watson, I'm an electrical power engineer. We are here in the heart of Hackney in the transmission substation that's owned by National Grid, my employer. I have over 20 years experience in building, commissioning, maintaining and repairing electricity substations of all shapes and sizes, just like this one. And tonight we're going to explore some of the historical and technical details about the electricity supply to Stoke Newington. This site that many people will be familiar with on the banks of the Lee Navigation in Millfields in Lower Clapton is a very historic site and very significant for the supply of electricity to East London. There are actually five substations within this complex and the site began its glorious history in the electricity supply as long ago as 1901 when Hackney Borough Council built their own electricity generating station over on the banks of the Lee, just yards from where I'm speaking now. Our story begins here, Lower Clapton, the historic industrial heart of Hackney on the banks of the Lee Navigation. And in 1901, Hackney Borough Council built their first electric generating station right here. In 1954, the then British Electricity Authority constructed a much larger power station on the same site next door. And we can make out the remains of the turbine hall. The red brick building that still stands behind us is the control block that would have housed chemistry labs, battery rooms, storage facilities. The spot where the bin lorries are parked now is the turbine hall, the heart of the power station where the electrical energy is made. You can make out those concrete buttresses that were cut off when the station was demolished in the 1980s give you some indication of the scale of the site. Coal would have been delivered by barge from the Lee Navigation, unloaded right here. Coal was also stored across on Hackney Marshes. A conveyor belt would transfer coal from the storage facility to be burned in the power station furnaces. Cooling water and feed water for the boilers would be taken from the Lee Navigation, purified and filtered as necessary and turned into steam in the power station behind me. Now the significance of that station in the context of Stoke Newington is that unlike Hackney Council, which decided to have its own generating station at substantial cost, Stoke Newington decided to have its own electricity department but to buy, buy the electricity in from their neighbours. Now the electricity supply industry is 140 years old. Public electricity supply in Great Britain and indeed the world began in England. Despite what many people think, it wasn't London. And if you're screaming at your screen now, Godalming in Surrey, then you win the prize. Because in 1881, powered from a water wheel at the mill, the streets of Godalming were lit with electric lighting. And that was a world first. Here we are 140 years later. If we go back to the 1880s and to the birth of the industry, the systems were all in private ownership and they were very disjointed. What I mean by that, there were a number of different municipal authorities that all had their own power stations. Some of them bought it in bulk from the neighbours, like Stoke Newington, and there were a number of private undertakings throughout London and indeed the entire country. The government passed the Electric Lighting Act of 1882, which for the first time was legislation that gave municipal undertakings and private companies the authority to lay cables within the road. Up until that point, it was not lawful to dig up the streets to put cables down. So some of those very early systems actually used overhead line strung on the chimney tops. After the Electric Lighting Act, local municipal undertakings and private companies could apply to Parliament for what was known as an Electric Lighting Order, an ELO. The borough of Stoke Newington applied for an ELO in 1901. But typical of the administrative and bureaucratic burden of the day, they didn't actually take their first supply until 1906. The Borough of Hackney applied for an ELO a little bit earlier, late 1890s, and they were able to get their generating station put into service in 1901. Now for a year, Stoke Newington took its electricity supply in bulk from Hackney A power station. 
I surmise that there was some kind of commercial dispute, maybe the price was too high, because after 12 months, that contract got terminated. And the borough of Stoke Newington instead took its supply from one of the private companies known as Northmet. They had a power station at Brimsdown and a cable was laid from Brimsdown down the Lee Valley into Stoke Newington that operated at 10,000 volts. And that provided all the electricity into the borough of Stoke Newington via the complex at Edwards Lane, which came into service in 1904. Every ampere of current into Stoke Newington flowed from Brimsdown for 20 years. Towards the late 1920s, electricity wasn't just used for street lighting and for lighting of domestic and industrial properties, but there was an increasing demand for industrial processes. Electric trams were very much a thing. Electric trains were a thing. The London Underground had its own power station at Lotts Road. It was built in 1904 and it ran for 99 years. Taking into account this rapid popularity of this new and, in theory, clean fuel, Stoke Newington had a requirement for an increase in capacity. So came back to neighbouring Hackney and took their supply once more from the power station that stood just a few metres from this spot. In those early days, the council's electricity department actually had its own refuse destructor down on Milton Road, which I believe is called Milton Grove these days. Uh, there was a, a refuse destructor which burned household waste. It had a capacity of 77 kilowatts by the mid-1930s, which is very small, enough to power about 77 modern homes. They used the electricity generated there to feed in to the system centered on the complex at Edwards Lane. So the substation at Edwards Lane performed a number of different roles. It had rotary conversion equipment, that is big motors and generators that are linked together and rotate. And we'll have a look at a former motor generator station at, at Wordsworth Road. And also it had static equipment like the substation that I'm in now. Remember that the London Electricity Board formed in 1948. They had the challenge of all those different companies. These systems running at different frequencies and different voltages have to be linked through what we call cycloconverters or motor generator sets. And this essentially is a, a spinning piece of machinery which takes up quite a bit of space. And those of you that are very adept at spotting substations as you go around London will notice some are considerably larger than others. They tend to be quite architecturally impressive as well. Much larger than it needs to be nowadays because originally it housed a motor generator set. Wow. Changed a bit since I was last in here. So we're in the 11 kV switch room now at Edwards Lane primary substation. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Steve Slade of UK Power Networks. This particular panel is of significant interest to us because it supplies Wordsworth Road transformer chamber. Now Wordsworth Road is a very impressive TC that was built in 1929 as a cycloconverter station, a rotary substation, and it's on Hackney Council's local list of non-designated heritage assets because it's of an architectural and heritage significance, and it's very pretty, and we're going to go and have a look at that. British History Online records Wordsworth Road as a rotary substation. That means it would have had large rotating machinery, hence the size. You'll notice an overhead travelling crane. This would have been used to service the motor generator set that sat here. And in the corner there is a grotty old toilet for the staff that would have worked and serviced the machinery. It's going to be an anticlimax for many, <laughs> but all we have in the present time is what's known as a transformer chamber. These normally fit into a much, much smaller footprint. There's the transformer, there's some HV switch gear, 
and there's a low voltage board with fuses and those fuses supply the cables that go out in the street along the streets into underground link boxes and into people's homes indeed into the school immediately opposite where Mark Bolan attended as a boy. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, there was a huge growth in the demand for electricity. Meanwhile, in London, the London Electricity Board had their work cut out. Many of the facilities had been brought into service from the early days of electric lighting orders, were coming up to 50, 60 years of age, needed modernization. And that's what LEB did. Edwards Lane remained the nerve center for electricity supply to the whole of Stoke Newington. Gradually, the motor generator set was phased out and a whole new substation was constructed at Edwards Lane by the LEB in the mid 1960s. In fact, two substations were built on the same site, Edwards Lane A and Edwards Lane B. Such was the foresight, much of it is still in service to this day. We'll go over in a moment and have a look at the 66,000 volt circuit breakers, which supply the cables over to Edwards Lane substation. Cables that were laid by London Electricity Board in the mid 1960s. This circuit breaker behind me operates at 66 thousand volts and it's just one of four feeders from here Hackney down to Stoke Newington Edwards Lane this just happens to be the first one so between here and Edwards Lane are four 66,000 volt cables laid under the streets of London and buried fairly deeply This site at Edwards Lane has been a linchpin of electricity supply, very much a hub for 115 years for Stoke Newington. And to this day, it's still alive, providing you, connecting you with your daily energy. In amongst all this new cabling that's been in here just a couple of years, beneath my feet, we have the original 1960s installed 66,000 volt cables. There are four of these troughs to protect them. And they come from Hackney and they connect into the transformers. This, this is the cable that's coming in from Hackney, the 66 KV cable that's coming in from Hackney. Um, it's going across on the ceiling end to the new ceiling end, which is going to the C transformer that we've just been into. Throughout the whole of London, it, the phases are rolled. So from left to right across the transformer, we connect blue, red, yellow, instead of red, yellow, blue. Now that's known as the Battersea colors because someone in the 1920s at Battersea Power Station got the phases crossed and that set the standard that everything we've done from that day to this has to integrate with what's already there. It's remarkable to think we're in the very heart of Stoke Newington now, the Church Street just over there, the Town Hall, Cliss Old Park over there. And we're surrounded by dense urban development and this relatively small site feeds, supplies the energy to over 50,000 homes. 115 years ago, we could say with confidence that Stoke Newington was supplied using coal fired electricity at Brimsdown and at Hackney. Nowadays, your guess is as good as mine. But what matters is the infrastructure and for Stoke Newington, 
this is where the action is, Edwards Lane. Electricity substations confuse and frighten a lot of people in equal measure. But fundamentally, there are three things that go on. They are switching, transformation and reactive compensation. So the vast majority of substations are limited to the switching and transformation bits. So let me just explain those. First of all, let me explain the word substation. If we go back to 1882, the Electric Lighting Act, those very, very first generating stations were called just that, generating stations. Municipal authorities started to use the term electric lighting station. They then became known as central stations. As systems grew even more and it was necessary to transmit or distribute electricity at higher voltages, there comes a point that we need to step that down to a safe voltage to cable it into your home. So sub-central stations were the facilities whereby the electric current was refined, ready for the final destination. The word later got shortened to substation. So here at Hackney, there are five substations in one complex. Over in Stoke Newington, Edwards Lane is the main substation. Within the remainder of Stoke Newington, I estimate there's probably something like 50 transformer chambers, distribution substations at the end of your street. Each one of those contains a transformer, typically rated at about 800 kVA, means it can boil 400 kettles or so. By the late 1960s, early 1970s, our transmission and distribution systems had reached a level of maturity. And the demand for electricity, which had grown very steeply since the interwar years, had actually reached a plateau. And in some parts of the country, it was actually starting to fall off. So that, that allowed the Central Electricity Generating Board and the area boards all in public ownership throughout those decades to almost not sit back on their laurels, but to, to a certain extent to live off the investment, that hard won investment that had been made in the post-war years. The systems were built, they were, they were plenty of capacity within them, they just needed to be kept, maintained in good order. What happened after that by 1990, the government then decided to privatise the electricity industry, almost going back to how things started in 1882. The Central Electricity Board was carved into three, sold to the private sector. The area boards were all privatised and there have been numerous changes of ownership and changes of brand identity since then. But what's remained unchanged is the physical infrastructure. So it's quite fascinating that the kit that feeds the supply to Stoke Newington to this day, the core of it, the core of it was put in by LEB in, in 65. The people are largely the same, the equipment's the same, it's just a different corporate identity and it's the same for many of those companies. I know it's hard to keep track, but substations fundamentally fulfill the same role as they did 140 years ago. When one looks back over 115 years of electricity supply to Stoke Newington. What are the things that really stick out for me? The demanding growth for use of electricity, for the utilisation, the longevity of the systems, the actual infrastructure. I think it's fair to say it, it has lasted and outperformed the expectations of its original designers. The fundamental nature of the way we transmit the fundamental nature of the business we carry out is really just continuing a fine tradition. So our journey ends here at this low voltage switchboard. We started off at Hackney 400,000 volt substation. Remember those big white pipes? And we've covered everything in between. This operates at one thousandth of that voltage. Between the phases here are just 400 volts. Still enough to give me a nasty shock, which is why we're inside a cage. But this low voltage board, which was installed in the 1950s, supplies the cables go out into the street 
buried underneath the paving slabs. And the next stop after this is the electricity meter underneath your stairs.